Good afternoon. Thank you guys for joining us today. It is 12 o'clock, so we will go ahead and um, get started now. We have a really awesome executive talk with Mike Brown, and I will actually let our uh, moderator, Maeva Ghana, go ahead and introduce Mike. Uh, Maeva, if you would like to kind of take it from here and then we can jump right into the presentation. And, and Maeva is the chair of the Quantum Initiative Advisory Board and she's also the Quantum Working Group Chair at ATARC. So she's really the one who put this all together for us. Um, over to you, Maeva. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to welcome Mike Brown, the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of ISARA Corporation to our special series on quantum risks. Mike is focused on the technical vision and direction of ICERA, a security solutions company specializing in creating crypto agile and quantum safe security solutions. Prior to ICERA, Mike was the vice president of security product management at BlackBerry, where he co-founded the product security practice and was responsible for the vision and execution. Mike, also, Mike holds a master of mathematics from the University of Waterloo focusing on photography. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. And Mike, thank you for your generosity and for joining us today. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation and looking forward to speaking to everyone today. Uh, if you'll give me a moment here, I'm going to get my presentation started then. Um, Kirsten or Mava yell if you can't see the slides right now. I'm assuming it, it works then. We've unfortunately had a lot of practice in uh, video conferencing over the last 11-ish uh, months or so. So thank you very much for having me today. Um, the presentation I was hoping to walk through today was to talk a little bit about the this quantum risk thing and this quantum threat thing um, that a lot of us are, are grappling with within industry and talk a little bit about, about what the impact is to your organization and what are some of the things you should start thinking about today in order to make sure that you're prepared for it then. So uh, in the, the kind introduction from uh, Maeva, the, uh, you know, I'm from ICERA. Um, we're a Waterloo, Canada-based company who is focused on really the problem of how do companies become crypto agile and ready so that they can um, address things like the quantum threat within their organizations. Uh, we are almost six years old um, with a, a very heavy focus on looking at uh, quantum safe cryptography, how to implement it, how to integrate it into um, customer um, uh, customer products, um, and then working with organizations to help them understand what the risk is and how they need to prepare. So if we look across the industry and what 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 people when they sort of speculate uh, through their crystal balls, you know, the the consensus seems to be, you know, somewhere within the next five to probably 10 ish years, there's going to be quantum computers that can break the cryptography that we use for protecting our organizations in the internet around the world. And so obviously this is a big issue um, that we need to start preparing for. And it's a today issue. It's not a tomorrow issue because organizations have data that they um, have within their um, environments today that might be at risk. So you know, this is a sea change event where organizations are gonna need to start looking at how they are preparing for this type of threat. And then how do they prepare for these types of threats in the, the future? You know, This isn't gonna be a, a one-off um, type of thing that they have to worry about then. And it's going to lead to a lot of investment that's gonna to need to happen within an IT environment then. But let's go kind of step back a little bit before we kind of go too far in this around this whole kind of quantum computing thing. And, and it's important to remember sort of, you know, these quantum computers that are coming are, are, are a little bit different than what we're used to in terms of the computers say that you're using for interacting with this webinar today. If we think about existing computers that we're all familiar with, they have these bits, things called bits inside of them. And they're ones and zeros. And traditionally we think of them um, in terms of say a light bulb being on or off to represent whether it's a zero or a one. And we do computation in these computers based off of these facts. And we have you know all of these different metrics for measuring how powerful these computers that we have are. But it's all based off of this fact that we have these zeros and we have these ones. Um, and we can do them and you can interact with them in predictable ways. Now, quantum computers exploit the fact that we have um, quantum physics to do some really interesting and different things. You know, fundamentally, there's these um, interesting physics properties under the covers then that mean that, well, you know what, 
we don't really have a zero or a one. We kind of have both of them sort of in, in, in these different intermediate states that perhaps we can interact with them. Now, if we think about it um, uh, sort of uh, broadly, that would mean that if let's say we had what we call quantum bits or qubits, if we had 10 of them, they can't just be in um, say uh, a number of different states, like say 10 different states, we could have an exponential number of possible states because each um, qubit could be a zero and a one at the same time and all of those states in between. So we could kind of get excited and think, well, that means that if we had say 16 qubits, we could do two to the 16 or 65,000 calculations at the same time. Now, unfortunately, physics doesn't let us quite do something like that, but it kind of gives us a bit of an insight into the power that a quantum computer could give us because there's just this so much larger spectrum of information that we could possibly interact with and different types of um, states of that information that we could interact with all at the same time. The whole field of quantum computing is about taking these insights that we've known about for decades and try to turn them into engineering and commercial systems that we could deploy um, in different types of environments. Now, we've gone through this before as a society. The idea of digital computers didn't start with the Pentium. You know, it didn't start with some, say, a chip that Intel gave us one day. It started with these very early ideas going all the way back to even looms and things like that, where if we can interact with information with ones and zeros on and off, then maybe we can start to build computing around that then. And, you know, everyone remembers going through things like punch cards and the idea of vacuum tubes and eventually settling on transistors as being sort of our method of dealing with those ones and zeros and the logical operations that, that go on inside a computer. Well, we're going through the, the identical type of process right now in the quantum computing world. I said before, we have these kind of neat physical quantum physical properties that allow us to think about different state, different bits being in different states at the same time then. Well, the work now is taking that really cool physics insights and turning them into engineering solutions that allow us to interact with those states in, you know, at the kind of high end of this, this chart we see, see here in fault tolerant ways. And just like in digital computing, how we were going through the process of looking at, you know, vacuum tubes and other types of ways of representing bits before we eventually got to transistors, we're going through the same type of environment with quantum computers right now, where we're thinking about, well, do we work with ions? Do we work with superconducting qubits? Do we work with other more exotic ways of representing information? And some of the companies that you see um, listed at the bottom here are thinking about some of those different technologies. And one of the races, which is going on around the world right now, is what is that technology going to be in the future that we're going to rely upon and build upon for uh, quantum computers? And we're seeing a lot of great progress. Um, in this. We're, you know, IonQ, um, which is a, a US company, has moved up in sort of the stage five right here, where we're starting to get into what are called logical qubits, where we can do calculations involving them there. And, you know, this is a matter of time as we continue to uh, uh, work through all of the engineering problems, um, which are, are many and complicated in order to get to fault tolerant uh, quantum computing. Now, as I said before, quantum computers have rely on this interesting property where we can interact with different states at the same time. And because of that property, we can solve some really neat problems um, that we can't with existing computers today. These are things like in quantum chemistry, dealing with more efficient ways to create fertilizers, um, uh, looking at different types of material science. Unfortunately, and the, the point of this whole webinar um, is that one of the things that a quantum computer also can solve is a math problem. And that math problem happens to underlie the cryptography that we use across the internet today. Shor's algorithm, which is the quantum algorithm um, uh, that was uh, invented by or discovered by Peter Shor, um, actually allows us to efficiently with a quantum computer break RSA and elliptic curves and, and Diffie-Hellman as well too. Um, and so what that means is that if we had a quantum computer that's big enough, and we can talk about later what big enough means, then, um, you need different math. You need a different type of solution in order to protect um, information on the internet. There's another algorithm called Grover's algorithm, which I'm not gonna focus on in this talk here, which also causes problems for things like symmetric algorithms and hash functions. Um, but we don't need to worry about that one as much 
is because it's not as as devastating a break as what Shor's algorithm is. Yes, we have to do some good uh, crypto hygiene around the size of keys that we use and the size of hash functions that we use, but um, this is in the realm of more of a normal type of problem for us to solve rather than thinking about, well, what do we replace elliptic curves with um, that Shor um, forces us to consider. Now, as my Eva said, my background is mathematics. <clears throat> Excuse me, I came from a cryptography background. Um, and so I love focusing on the math problems and the math solutions that we can think about. But the problem around crypto is that we've been very, very good at making sure that it is part of all of our IT infrastructure that we rely on. If you think about your day and the types of systems that you interact with, maybe it's putting a Bluetooth headset on in order to listen to this call. Maybe it's connecting to the actual Zoom servers um, through the Zoom app in order to get access to this. Maybe it's using your phone to check your bank account um, through your online banking um, application. All of those have cryptography as being some part of those solutions then. Cryptography is plumbing and it is used throughout our IT infrastructure in ways that we don't even think about it anymore. Like we have to remember the RSA, um, uh, uh, the idea for the RSA algorithm, uh, this is coming from the late 1970s, you know, elliptic curves, so the early 1980s, where these ideas came about and then being commercialized and, and um, standardized and created into all these types of systems. So they are, are everywhere. And so when we start thinking about, well, how do we change the, the plumbing that we use across our, even in our IT environments, this is a very large IT problem. Um, and so these aren't changes that are gonna happen in a day or two. Like these are going to be multi-years or potentially decade-long changes depending on the size of your organization to get ready for this then because crypto touches everything then. Now, um, I'll talk a little bit about standardization later on. There's a lot of awesome work going on there, but the point, if there's one takeaway to take from this presentation is the fact that changing the fundamental crypto that you're going to use within your environment is going to take years. This is a large scale IT problem that you need to start thinking about today and start planning for today. Just because as you can see, it impacts so many different things in your environment. Now what's vulnerable? Now I, I mentioned before, and, and this also speaks to the scale, um, the math is sort of that, that from my point of view, the really fun area to think about then, these are what we call the crypto systems then. We know that the crypto systems are gonna to have to change to move to something new then. This is sort of that, 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 that pearl inside all the systems here. But if I'm thinking about that banking example, when I connect into my bank, I don't connect using RSA, I connect using a protocol. This is the protocol, which is the, if crypto is the language, the protocol is the grammar on how we can actually go in and speak to the system. How do I negotiate? What crypto I want to use? How do I exchange keys between two parties then? This is all that that sort of, you know, we're into things flowing along those, those um, pipes um, between the two environments then. And all these protocols have assumptions on how the crypto works because we've been using RSA for decades then, or using elliptic curves for decades then. And these protocols, have to be rethought around how can we integrate these new math schemes into them and make sure that things don't break along the way. But if I'm connecting to a bank, um, say using my phone to check the, my bank balance, then it doesn't, I don't use the protocol directly then, I'm gonna use a, a product, some type of application then to actually do it then. There's gonna be code which under the covers is gonna then interact with that protocol then to do the connection. Maybe it's gonna use something like OpenSSL, which is um, one of the most commonly used uh, open source crypto libraries in the world. But these products, they don't necessarily know about the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman problem, they know about the fact that they call into a library and the library does the security stuff for them then. And so those products then have assumptions. Let's say it's a car when I'm starting up a vehicle, there are rules around how long it'll take for the heads up display to show up within the car then. Um, if cryptography, it becomes a sticking point for that, then that's gonna cause a lot of disruption into that product cycle then. So, the, the, per, the purpose of this slide here is to really focus on the fact that you know, the crypto problem is in some sense the easy problem. It's this integration problem on top of it, which is where all this work is gonna come from. And it really kind of calls itself out, we think in really sort of three different um, uh, main use cases today, which I'll talk through a little bit later on, but this confidentiality, roots of trust, and then identity management. 
which I also then talk about in this slide as well too. But I, these are really important because we think it covers off that gamut of the, um, how do I protect my data? So my confidentiality uh, communications, which are flowing across the internet, which maybe I don't want people to read in the future, but then authenticity. How do I trust that I'm getting software on a device um, that I'm actually getting it from who I think the manufacturer is? Or how do I know that I'm connecting into a system and knowing it's actually Amazon that I'm connecting to? Or know that I'm connecting into you know, an AKO system or Army Knowledge Online, that it's actually that system that I'm connecting with and that system knows that it's actually me that are connecting into it. All of those are based off of cryptography then, um, which um, will have a large impact from this threat. So let's talk through um, these here and look at some of the specifics around um, what this actually means. So we said before, we have this crypto um, uh, uh, threat coming from quantum computers, but quantum computers don't exist today. They can break um, RSA or elliptic curves. You know, as, as I mentioned before, um, some of the speculation puts it around, you know, let, let's use say um, uh, we're in 2021 right now, let's say like 2030 as a time frame. But when I send information on the internet, so for example, we're all using Zoom right now, when Zoom is connecting in from the client, from my um, uh, laptop, is connecting into the Zoom cloud in order to be the broker for all these connections to take place then, I am doing that um, connection using something akin to a VPN or a TLS connection then, where um, step one is I do a, a handshake between my client and the server. And during that process, we agree upon um, keys. The way we agree upon those keys is using, say, RSA or elliptic curves, doing some type of um, exchange uh, between them, where I send a little bit of information, server sends a little bit of information, we um, scramble them together, and that's how we get, say, an AES key at the end. Once we agreed upon that AES key, then we use the AES key then to encrypt all the bulk traffic. So all the information which is flowing over the connection um, for the, you know, the rest of time or until we have to renegotiate it then. Now, that key establishment part, so that part where we're setting up that shared key in the handshake there, that happens over the internet, which of course it has to then. Um, but the, um, but all of that, the security of that is based off of the elliptic curve problem or the RSA problem um, underneath it then. So if I have a quantum computer um, that can break that math problem, then I can figure out what the AES key is and then I can read the traffic. But what's more insidious about all of this then is that it's not just, um, it's not just the fact that I can say break this um, sometime in the future. What I can say about this is that actually those communications are going on the internet today. And so if I'm an adversary and I want to read your communication, say 10 years from now, when I have a quantum computer, what I just do is I store those encrypted communications and know that as soon as I have a quantum computer that's big enough, I can go back and then read this traffic that's here. So, you know, in some sense, this is a, an ongoing data breach. If you have information that still needs to be secret 10 years from now, um, and, you, and it's important enough for that then. So there are solutions on how to provide that protection for systems that do need this type of longer term protection then. This is a, this idea of hybrid um, key establishment. I won't go into sort of the math on how it works. Um, um, NIST has a great uh, guide talking about sort of how you can go about doing this using um, uh, FIPS compliant um, systems then. But basically the idea is you mix in keys from multiple algorithms and then the out, you stir all those together using something called a key derivation function. And then this is a case of now that, that hybrid key you have at the end you know, provides protection from both classical computers and quantum computers um, then. So while we work through the standardization process, this is a nice risk mitigation that you can do if you have systems that need to be protected 10 years from now because of um, data that's gonna be flowing out today. Um, this is a way to actually deploy something today to provide that sort of future protection. Um, uh, if you know that someone is gonna be storing your communications to try to access later on. If you're talking about, well, let's decide on where to meet for lunch. You probably don't need that level of security there, but there is some things that in, go on in agencies or enterprises where you do need that, that long-term uh, level of protection. The second one here is software updates. Um, if we look at all of the systems that are around us in our house today, more and more of them are running software. Um, if we look at, I think the stat I saw for um, one of the newest Ford F-150s was something like 140 million lines of code. It is a, a terrifying uh, number of lines of code for anyone that grew up in software. Um, but all of that code 
is running everything from the um, uh, the radio system, satellite radio, um, the controlling the um, heating and air conditioning system in the vehicle, or running braking systems. Because of course, cars run are the cars are drive by wire. You don't when you push a pedal unless you have an older car. It doesn't actually. Um, uh, force more gas to go into a spark plug or go into um, the area um, so that the piston can fire um, and drive more power out of the car then. Um, there's a system of using things called CAN bus, which is the networking stack um, in uh, most cars today, um, to actually um, tell computer circuits to do these types of things then. All of this runs on software. And how do we know that we have the right software in the vehicle then? Well, just by having things called roots of trust. The software is um, signed by the manufacturer or the person creating the, um, uh, creating the part for the car. Um, and there's a public key which is burned into the uh, vehicle itself. Um, and then uh, when a new software update, typically installed today by say a USB stick by um, a mechanic, um, when you bring your car in for service, um, it verifies that that's authentic then. Now, how do we actually, what's that public key based off of? Well, the, you know, I think you can figure out the, the punchline here. It's gonna be based off of something which is um, uh, going to be vulnerable to uh, quantum computers. So we need to start thinking about, well, what can we do today? And this is a very specific use case. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, um, um, actually, I'll just go to the next one then. Um, let's think about, uh, let's, let's stay, keep the thread going on the vehicle use case. Um, but this use case is also very similar for a lot of long-lived um, uh, things that are out there as well too, such as planes, um, such as um, you know, where I live in Ontario, um, there are lots of windmills doing power generation around us because it's flat and windy um, around us then. Um, these are things that have software running on them, which are difficult to do software updates on them. But Let's stick with the vehicles um, for the case of this example then. Imagine we are talking about a car in 2035. So where we are, we're in 2021 right now. When does the quantum threat start to affect vehicles then? Well, as I said before, you know, 2026 to 2030 is some of the dates that we see bandied about. Let's just say it's a range in there. At some point in there, presumably there's a quantum computer that can break modern crypto. So if you have a vehicle which um, is on the road during that time frame and it's using elliptic curves for authenticating software, then that vehicle's at risk. So um, imagine a car in 2035 that's on the road then. When did that car come about? When did it get created? When? What's the inception story for it then? Well, you know, on average, cars are on the road for call it 11 and a half years, about 10 to 15 years. So that means car on the road in 2035, you know, it was probably around 2023, uh, 2024, when that actually went on the road in the first place then. The um, design production life cycle for a vehicle is around, you know, four to six, sometimes eight years for it then, which means if it's on the road in 2023 or 2024, it actually started its sort of lifetime process from you know twinkle in a designer's eye um, three or four years ago. So it's actually in, you know, in the middle of the production life cycle today for a vehicle that is going to be on the road in 2035. And so that means if I'm an automaker looking at a my my, well, 2021, we're talking about our 2022 model year vehicles. We know that those cars are going to be on the road um, after quantum computers that should break the crypto inside of it. So we actually need to think about that problem today of how do we ensure that software running on a vehicle is actually going to be protected both from classical computers, but also quantum computers. Um, and luckily, there are solutions which are available um, uh, today. There's already a NIST special publication looking at hash based signatures. This is a um, specific solution, which isn't for general purpose. It's very much more for things like um, software updates then, but it's a way to provide protection um, uh, in this case then. Um, because you know, while we're talking about say software updates that involve um, I, you know, using it say a USB stick at a mechanics office, it actually, you know, the, the drive, um, no pun intended, across the entire industry is to over-the-air software updates. And the reason we want to go over-the-air software updates is it's about $33 billion in um, both the combination of savings and revenue opportunities for automakers. So there's enormous um, financial drivers around moving to over-the-air software updates. But if you can't rely on the root of trust anymore, you can't do an over-the-air software update to 
you need to do physical recalls, and those are expensive. And finally, the other big threat that we see a lot of focus on right now is on that authentication um, side of things. So software updates are about roots of trust. This is about more the identity management system in someone's environment then. Now, we have to kind of compare and contrast these two. If we look at the problem of, say, confidential information going on the internet today, the concern is someone storing it, harvesting it today, and decrypting it, say, 10 years from now, and look at communications. You can do that in the confidentiality case. In the authentication case, I can only really attack someone in the moment. I can only do it if I have a quantum computer available to me that I can start forging signatures and pretending to be someone. So that means that I can't run that attack today until I have a quantum computer in the future. But identity, man identity management systems are incredibly complicated, not so much just with the PKI, that, that's sort of the clean part. It's in terms of the actual system that it lives within. So let's, let's look at DoD, for example. There's over four and a half million um, identity access management users within uh, DoD. This is using common access cards, CAT cards, or moving into the PIV cards, for example, then. Um, but it's not just about the cards. It's the fact that, you know, we have this complex diagram there showing the, um, the, the different bridges between all of the different um, CAs that are out there for just specifically DoD and um, agency users and defense contractors and, and, and. But then it's all of the systems under the covers that rely upon that um, identity and access management credential. When I do um, uh, physical access control into a building, I'm going to be checking credentials. When I log on to my system, it's checking credentials. When I'm sending a signed email message with SMIME, it's using my credentials, using different keys which are on those cards. And so the the IT migration problem here is that one, we have to fix the math problem, but then two, we need to change the cards, and three, we need to change all the applications on top of it then. So you can see how this is going to be an enormous time consuming process to switch over from what we have today to what we're going to have in the future then. Um, and that's because these systems are, are not as agile as they need to be then. So, so I've, I've been hopefully not too doom and gloom so far talking about the impact from quantum computers to um, the cryptography world, but there are solutions. And there's, there's really two ways to approach this problem here. Um, I'll give you the, the spoiler alert. My background is mathematics. So I'm gonna kind of gear to one side um, then, but let's touch on both of them. Um, colloquially, we have physics and we have math as ways to problem then. Um, the physics problem or the physics approach is typically called quantum key distribution and the math approach is called quantum safe cryptography or post-quantum cryptography. I'll stick to quantum safe for going forward here but um, there's two ways um, uh, to approach this. Quantum key distribution, I'll just give you a bit of a, um, a background on it. The idea here is that I want to share quantum states between two people and quantum states, um, a, a company ED Quantique has a great way to describe them. Think of a quantum state as like um, a soap bubble. It's incredibly fragile. Um, and if someone interacts with it, then you can tell because it's gonna pop then. Um, the idea for QKD is based on the fact that if I share two quantum states, typically photons that have been oriented in, in different, um, uh, uh, different directions, um, if I share those quantum states um, between what's typically called in crypto Alice and Bob, if someone in the middle observes that connection, then I can actually detect that someone has observed the, that interaction there, which means that there's eavesdropping protection built into the exchange then. Um, that's cool. That is a great physics property to have there. The challenge, of course, is implementing um, QKD and then deploying it then. Um, typically, the way you deploy QKD is going to either be with fiber optics um, between uh, two environments then or using um, uh, ground to satellite. Uh, connections then. Uh, fiber optics have distance limitations um, and then just physical limitations of having a wire between two people then. Um, so we think it, this is very much some specific use cases where this is really interesting um, to use, um, but you'll see it has to be really used in tandem then with other uh, more mathematics-based systems because of course I can't use QKD at this point to get keys into my phone. Um, that, that, that 
I don't have fiber optics going into my phone, at least that I'm aware of um, then. We also see this as being um, uh, you know, a huge investment going on around the world. Um, uh, China, for example, has put um, satellites in orbit. Um, even here in Canada, there's uh, work going into a uh, KeySat project about getting um, a satellite in orbit to do testing around this here as well too. But still, um, you know, um, very cool physics problem, but it has some implementation concerns. The other approach we'll, we'll call the, I call the new math here, but it's based off of looking at the fact that if, if the math problems that underlie R, RSA and ECC are broken, maybe there's new math problems that we can rely upon that don't suffer the same fate. Um, I talked a little bit about the stateful hash base solutions there. This is at the top right corner there. Um, this is very much a um, uh, signing solutions, maybe like root certificates um, solutions. And um, it solves one problem really well, but it doesn't go broadly out there to solving sort of general like TLS connections in your environment then. Um, you know, but there are customers out there and there's people already deploying these types of solutions today using stateful hash based signatures. Um, and so they're sort of uh, pictured in that box over there. Typically they're gonna require a hardware security module. Um, and that's because the key management, the sort of the state management associated with stateful hash based signatures is very challenging to do then. On the left-hand side here, you see um, what I consider to be the, the sort of the five main candidates in math that, that we're looking at in terms of what's the new standard going to be. Um, I'll talk a little bit about sort of um, broader standards um, work going on, but let's focus specifically here on NIST because you know, NIST really has the mandate around what are the math, the crypto primitives um, that we're going to then be using going forward then. Um, NIST's role is in setting FIP standards. Um, uh, the FIP standards then are defining um, what the US federal government is going to need. Um, here in Canada, we also end up um, sort of following those and Canada and the US actually work together um, on um, the, the validation side, so called the CMVP, um, which is between NIST and, and CSC um, here in Canada around making sure that implementations meet the needs of the FIP standards then. But going back to these five math areas then, um, I'm not gonna uh, go into a lot of detail on them. There's a lot of cool stuff on them here. And, and if there's questions at the end, I'm happy to take them about specific ones there. But really they kind of run the gamut from stateless hash based signatures, which sort of fall into more computer science -y type things, all the way over to isogenies, which are very heavily into the, um, uh, the pure mathematics um, environment then. And then codes and lattices and multivariate kind of in between um, those two there. All of them, we've been very lucky with RSA and ECC in that you can use those math problems to basically solve both the um, key establishment and the signature problem very, very cleanly and well. Um, we don't have that same luxury here where we end up having sort of pick and choose which which schemes are better for some things than others. You know, isogenes, for example, have some really interesting what are called CHEMS, um, uh, Keynes Capillation um, methods, um, but they don't seem to admit yet um, efficient signature schemes. So there's a lot of great analysis going in here. At the bottom of this chart, you see sort of the, the process that's going on. So, you know, back in, in 2016 is when the standardization process began. Um, from from NIST looking at, well, what are the new, um, what are, we're calling, our uh, focus on chems right now and signature scheme is going to be. Um, we've worked our way through. We're currently, as you see today, we're in the uh, middle of round three. There's a conference that's going to happen in June, I believe, of this year um, to focus on round three. And the outcome from this year um, are going to be standards looking at, call it 2023 to 2024 of chems and signatures but um, probably not finished at that point then. Um, probably gonna have a round four as well too to look at additional schemes as well too. But the, you know, the thing about um, uh, cryptography is that you know, we can't, can't prove a negative. You know, we, we can't go and say that a scheme is going to be um, invulnerable to any attacks then. The best that we can say is we've done a lot of great analysis. We know these are the best attacks on these schemes and we really need what's sometimes called the test of time. Um, on schemes to make sure that we can, that they're trustworthy and reliable enough, both from the math primitives, but then also from how you go about implementing them as well too. And so that's why this takes a long time and involves a huge number of people um, to get the right type of analysis uh, to get to a point where we're comfortable with it then. Now I mentioned 
um, uh, NIST focusing on the crypto primitive side, but they're of course not the only ones internationally um, looking at this. You have Etsy, um, the European Telecom Standard Institute, which most people are familiar with in the context of cellular standards. So 3G, 4G, 5G as well. Um, Etsy has a lot of great work going in looking at how do you use those crypto primitives in different types of protocols and solutions. And of course, how those will then fit into things like 5G as well. You have the IETF, which their, their task is to define how the internet works. Uh, it's the Internet Engineering Task Force. And so they look after things like um, TLS, which of course is how you securely connect to your, um, through your web browser, or um, um, Ike IPsec, which is how your VPN works, since I'm sure almost everyone on this call is remotely connected into uh, an office um, from some home um, environment then. X9, which looks at sort of North American financial industries, um, ISO, which I'm sure everyone has heard of for international standards, um, and ITUT, which again is looking at some of these sort of more telecom um, uh, style um, standards there as well. And this is just a subset. So these are some of the major ones that are out there. And again, it goes to show just really the, the sheer size associated with this type of transition of moving from one, uh, one type of crypto primitives that we've relied upon to something uh, completely different. And again, coming back to from a, an organization company perspective, you know, the reason this becomes so big is because crypto touches everywhere. If we think about a typical IT environment that we have, you know, if I was going back 20 years, we'd have desktop computers, we'd have servers, we, we wouldn't have mobile devices, we, we wouldn't have this cloud thing at this point then, that was maybe um, a glimmer. You know, cloud is people thinking about, oh, back in the old days with mainframes and time sharing. We didn't, it was a much simpler environment in a lot of ways. Now, if I think about how is a typical um, IT organization architected, I'm gonna have on-premise solutions, I'm gonna have cloud solutions, I'm gonna have maybe some hosted solutions, which maybe aren't quite cloud. Um, so I have different environments where they live. I have um, some user environments where I have an identity management system for connecting my corporate users into my on-premise systems, but maybe then I need to federate into a different system to access other types of cloud environments then. Um, I'm gonna have a whole supply chain to think about here because I'm gonna have systems that I control myself, systems that I'm contracting out into maybe in that cloud environment, but then maybe systems, if I'm a defense contractor, I'm connecting into DOD systems as well too. So I have to think about sort of this, this crossover point. And then of course, there's always the systems that I built myself from scratch versus systems that I've contracted someone to build on my behalf versus systems which I just buy, go out to my OEMs and purchase then. And cryptography is, fit, is fits everywhere in this environment here. And so this, this is a complex problem. And so if I'm an organization, what do I need to do? Well, step one here is going to be just understand what my, my risk is. Like, what is this risk that I have to my environment here? And step two, of course, is now thinking about how do I start to remediate this risk? Recognizing that I'm not re remediating it today because those crypto solutions aren't standardized yet. Um, but I do need to think about, well, what are my systems that maybe I'm going to be um, you know, shutting down and mothballing in three years? So I'm, I'm not too worried about it. What are my systems where I'm gonna rely upon standards to solve the problem for me? Because maybe I'm, I'm a bank and I know that my credit card environment then is really defined by a number of different um, financial services standards. And so I need to wait for those standards to get set. And then my OEM supplier to implement those standards to have them in my, then bring them into my environment then. But I need as a, uh, you know, IT manager, as a CISO, um, whatever my role might be, I need to know what the plan is. I need to know what's gonna happen and how I can make sure I'm ready. And one of the things which, you know, we talk to a lot of customers um, and we kind of find out there is that when you start probing them about, well, what cryptography do they actually have? Um, you start hitting blind spots because, well, they can, answer some of it really easily, but when you start kind of poking a little bit deeper and deeper, um, there's a lot of places where they don't even know what crypto they have in their environment then. You know, they're, they might have compliance standards, which they need to um, uh, work against and be compliant to, and they might have a compliance team, but that compliance team may not have control of all of the systems. Like imagine if you're in a multinational where you've been acquiring other companies, your IT environment might be a hodgepodge of systems that some of them you created, some of them you acquired through other systems and not everything's been um, consolidated together into one environment then. 
Now there's this very manual triaging and cataloging steps that kind of go on in a lot of organizations. And while we have to, we have had to deal with cryptographic migrations in the past, you know, thinking about SHA-1 to SHA-2 is being probably one of the most recent ones people have thought about. Um, I, you know, triple DES to AES and DES to triple DES um, back even further as well too. But these transitions, once you even know where all your crypto is, um, they can take a long time. You know, in a previous role that I had, I was involved in a product where we were switching from using um, triple DES as the transport cipher to AES. And we were, we created the client, we created the server, um, we looked after all the software in between them. Um, we had a lot of control. This was deployed with customers um, already out there. The process to go from, well, let's make the design choice to switch from triple DES to AES to all customers having deployed using AES was a multi-year process. And this is where we controlled everything. And the reason was because we didn't control everything. Customers had to worry about backwards compatibility. Customers had to worry about new clients working with upgraded, with upgraded servers, but also downgrade uh, older servers there as well. And so for us as a designer, we just think about all those different use cases. How do we make sure that we do the testing for all of those? How do we make sure that we deploy it in such a way that maybe it's off by default, but then customers can then choose to turn it on when enough of their clients have been upgraded then. And then when we get to the point where there is a uh, um, heavy enough, heavy enough um, grouping of people using the new systems that we can now turn on AES by default for everyone, but then have a way to turn it off for stragglers that are out there. There's there, you know, the devil's in the details on how this type of transition takes place. And you need to make sure you know, um, the, sort of the systems are as agile as possible to allow you to have control over that transition that takes place then. So where does that leave um, ICERA? What's our focus in this here? I'll do the minor plug uh, for us then. You know, really our focus is around quantum safe solutions and then providing agility solutions for customers then. You know, we have products where we actually implement quantum safe um, uh, schemes, doing everything from the math on up to integrations into common types of developer um, tooling that people rely upon. We do work in the PKI environment, looking at how can I help customers transition their systems from what they have today into using quantum safe solutions and being agile through that process. And we work with a lot of the uh, large sort of security infrastructure players that are out there, such as Digisur, Talus, um, Udamaco, FutureX, Venify, Sartigo, and BlackBerry um, out there then. Because the reality is, and I kind of want to keep harping on this point because it's so important, is that the use of cryptography in your environment is, is very, very complex. And it's going to affect systems that you build and you control yourself, but then also systems that your all of your OEM suppliers are building as well too. And so you know, when you are imagining a future state where all of your systems are quantum safe, it's going to involve this whole um, uh, spectrum of customers and partners and um, suppliers to you and yourselves all being transitioned to that state. So I, I'll switch back over to uh, Maeva to go through some uh, Q&A here as well too, but feel free to reach out to us for any questions that you may have, or if you're interested in sort of you know, checking out some of the tools that we're working on um, today uh, from a, an agility point of view. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Great presentation. Thank you again. So let's go ahead with the first question. The question is, what is the expected performance impact to implementation of quantum safe cryptography? Or ASICs on the horizon? That's the second part. Yeah, great question. Um, and one of the things that we're, we're a little bit lucky with in some of the cases is that common use cases, we, we seem fine with existing systems. So um, if I, I'll, I'll scooch back because I still have the slides up uh, to the slide where I had the different math areas. If I look at um, lattices, for example, lattices are, are blazingly fast. They're you know, very, very fast, they're actually faster than elliptic curves in, in many cases then. So that that's awesome. We can use existing systems for it. Um, but it becomes less about, to be honest, sort of the processing capabilities and more about sometimes, I was talking about that impact to different protocols. You know, if I think about um, uh, some of the different solutions, so, you know, um, if I look at uh, error correcting code based systems such as McLeese, they might have keys, depending on how you do it, that might be up in the megabit 
um, size. And so the, then it becomes less about what's your processing um, capabilities, but more about, well, how much packet space do you have or how much maybe even memory space that you have? Like if I'm thinking about my, my MacBook that I'm using for connecting in here, it has all of the processing capabilities that it needs. Um, for doing these systems here. But if I'm now thinking about a, an IoT um, uh, device, such as maybe a webcam, um, you know, it may not have enough stack space for dealing with these. So the, the concern that we see a lot and where we spend a lot of time with doing proof of concept work with um, especially OEM partners is them actually doing that type of tuning to see, well, I'm uh, looking at um, uh, switching over, so uh, vehicles right now, it's no secret, are, are switching from CAN bus to Ethernet as being sort of their um, their networking stack under the covers then. And as part of that, they, they're looking at what are the, the type of ECU power they need for the chipsets um, that are actually being used or say the braking unit to speak to the, the drivetrain. Um, and they need to know, um, can I authenticate those packets? Because of course, um, we need to make sure that the data coming from the, the braking um, ECU back to the drivetrain is correct because, well, of course, they, they kind of need to be coordinated together then. Um, and so we need to make sure that those ECUs can handle these systems. I will also say that's part of what the competition that NIST has been focused on here is, you know, really looking at that performance data, um, how long certain schemes take. Um, how, you know, what is the kind of code complexity even, you know, the, the terminology that's used sometimes in crypto is, you know, foot guns, you know, you want to avoid schemes that are going to be complicated to implement, um, where it's easy to make mistakes then. Um, so custom ASICs probably aren't going to need those um, to initially deploy them, or I think they're going to become more um, interesting is sort of looking into the future where we're really trying to make components sing. If you think about what we have in processors today, you might have hash functions as, as commands, or you might have um, like AES and I in Intel instruction sets or in, in ARM instruction sets, and that allows AES to go really, really fast. Well, we can actually utilize those in some of these schemes which are up here right now, um, and that really helps um, make them work even better. Thank you, Mike. The next question is, what are some clear steps that government officials must take now if they've not yet developed strategies to mitigate quantum risks for their agencies? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if, if I'm a government agency, um, you know, step one that you should really take is that, I'll call it an archaeological expedition. You need to start to understand the scope of what your problem is. We know what the problem is. We know that we're gonna to need to switch to quantum safe crypto, but I don't think many um, organizations have that, that scoping question answered. Um, and so step one is really starting to work with your IT teams and understanding you know, what crypto is out there in your environment then. Um, what, what are the things that you control yourself what are the systems that um, you need to talk to your suppliers about? Um, if I'm in government, you know, you know um, a really important tool that government has as a disposal disposal is the um, procurement process. If I'm putting out a an RFP for a new system, um, if it's a new system or a, a change to my system, I have the opportunity to call this out as being a requirement. Maybe it's not a requirement today in terms of deploying a solution, but maybe it's a requirement around upgrades to the system. Uh, making sure that quantum safe is part of the roadmap for a product that you're looking at then. So if I'm a government agency, step one is um, doing that, that cataloging step, understanding what I have. And then step two is identifying what are the systems that are most the highest priority to me to deal with. This might be priority in terms of risk associated with them. Um, it might be priority in terms of cost associated with changes to the system. Maybe it's a very fragile system and I need to think about rethinking that. But finally, I would really look at this and, and um, try to take advantage of this as an opportunity. Um, you know, much like when we've gone through large IT transitions in the past, anytime you, you know, I do home renovations, anytime you open up the walls, that's your opportunity to look at, are there other related things that you want to fix? Do you want to make it easier for you to make these changes in the future? And that's kind of what that whole idea of crypto agility is really about, is making future changes easier for you. And this is a great opportunity to start thinking about that in terms of how do you make your systems easier to change in the future. Thank you so much, Mike. Next question is, preparedness requires significant investments. How would you recommend that government officials raise awareness so that they're able to secure the investment funds needed 
to implement these solutions? Yeah, so I, I, I think in the US, it's a great question. In the US, um, something that happened um, before Christmas was, um, you know, the Quantum Act. And one of the things that, that's part of um, that act was, I think there's a six month um, uh, clock that started in terms of putting a plan together. So you have awareness there in terms of the need for fixing this. Um, you know, you have, um, you know, if, if you think back to, I showed that timeline there before of, you know, the work that NIST has been doing around um, standardizing the new schemes. Um, a lot, you know, publicly, a lot of that started back in August of 2015 when NSA put out a, um, a public post um, to actually call us out as a threat um, that need to be that needs to be fixed for um, classified and unclassified systems, um, and that's that's U.S. specifically there. So I, I think that really helps with sort of that awareness um, part of it there. If I'm talking to um, uh, an organization, um, uh, say in a private company or a public company, um, a, for them it's treating this as being an ongoing risk to your organization. Um, if you think about audit findings that go into um, the uh, board of directors. You know, this is a risk that you need to call out and then make sure a plan is in place for mitigating um, that risk then. Um, much like any other audit finding in an organization, you need to um, identify that you have that problem, um, then put a plan in place to deal with it. Thank you so much. We have many more questions. We'll try our best to answer as many as possible. We have one from Marvin Woods. His question is, please expand a little more on hybrid keys. Are sure. RSA-based algorithms mutually exclusive of quantum-resistant algorithms? Is today's microprocessing power sufficient? Thank you. So um, great question. Um, a way to think about hybrid keys is, to use an older term, it's a belt, uh, belt and suspenders um, type of approach. You know, think about uh, you put your pants on, you put a belt on, and then you add suspenders as well, too, to be really sure that your pants aren't going to fall off um, then. Uh, hopefully your pants fit in the first place, so you don't really need that then. Hybrid keys are very similar. You know, you mentioned RSA, uh, for example. So that means that if you are doing a key exchange, um, step one is you do your existing RSA key exchange uh, between Alice and Bob. Um, but then step two is then maybe you do a, um, let's pick on a lattice scheme, you do a Kyber exchange between Alice and Bob. And the outcome of that is two keys. Well, then you take those keys and then you run them through what's called a key derivation function, which is basically a really fancy, complicated way to hash the two of them together. And that outputs one result. It's kind of like when you're making a cocktail, you mix two, two ingredients together, you shake it up, and then the output is a delicious drink. This is very similar. So think of hybrid keys as being the same thing. Now, they're mutually exclusive in the sense that the way you add the two of them um, together is that um, if you can break one of the schemes, that doesn't break the output then. Much like when you mix two types of paint together, you can't unmix them to get the two colors at the end. Um, if someone, let's say, has a quantum computer can break RSA later on, as long as they can't break, say, the lattice scheme, then you're still protected. You're still protected um, by um, that lattice scheme there. So this is, again, very much in that risk mitigation world where um, by combining the two together, you get the benefit of both of those systems. So it's not a, um, a least common denominator, it's a most common denominator, where um, both of them provide the protection. And even if one of them um, breaks, the other one is still going to provide the protection then. As long as both of them don't break, then you're OK then. Um, the other comment in terms of from processing power um, as well to, um, again, the schemes that are typically recommended um, for doing a hybrid uh, key exchange, um, something like, say, a lattice scheme like Kyber, um, are quite efficient. Um, and so they can live alongside um, an RSA key establishment quite efficiently. And also, if you think about you know, where would this be used, let's say in a TLS um, connection, which is being set up, the key establishment portion is a very minor portion of the entire um, connection. Um, it is a you know um, milliseconds in the setup time, and then the remainder of it is the actual bulk encryption, uh, uh, the bulk connection, which is all the data flows back and forth. Then, so um, it's not something that a user would actually even see or register is taking place. Thank you so much, Mike. Our next question is from Bob Mariner. His question is, why aren't more enterprises de deploying quantum random generated key distribution platforms that are available now, especially to protect high value assets? 
Yeah, I, I, great question. And, and um, just as a, a quick aside for people that aren't aware, um, there's a lot of work going into also, I talked about QKD. The other thing in the kind of quantum security world is something called uh, quantum random number generators. The the 30 second explanation is that um, a, a QRNG works by, let's send a photon towards a, oh, let's see what um, Zoom virtual backgrounds do. Um, you have a half silvered mirror photon hits it, it's either going to go up or it's going to go straight. And it should do that up or straight with 50-50 um, probability. Um, and so if you keep doing that, then that allows you to give you your, your random bit stream. Um, so there's been a lot of work going into um, actually creating these on chip. So you can actually have these as chips in different environments. I know that um, there's been a lot of interest, I think, in the casino world um, for this as well, too, because of course, random numbers are, are pretty important there. Um, so I, I would 100. So first of all, I would 100% say that using physical random number generators are a great solution um, uh, for any environment. Then we've been using physical random number generators um, even on chip for um, a long time in computer systems. There, um, I, I think one of the challenges that QRNGs have right now is sort of the size of their package. So there's a lot of work um, around trying to shrink them so that they can fit better on chip and um, say something like a phone. I know there's been um, Ide Quantique has been doing some work with um, uh, SK Telecom, um, and I think it's Samsung has um, a phone out there that showcases the use of a, a QRNG. So that, that that's great seeing that progress there. But sort of the, the 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 physical size of them has been one of the drawbacks to them um, there as well too. And I know there's been some work looking into um, uh, some of the bias associated with them, uh, but typical things there. But yeah, no, I I think kind of broadly the use of physical random number generators, whether it's a QRNG, whether it's um, say something based off of um, radioactive of decay, um, which is another type of system, um, even like ring oscillators, things like that. Like those are all um, extremely important for making sure that any crypto system is secure. Thank you, Mike. The next question is, are there credible estimates as it relates to the financial costs to all industries or specific industries on making the transition or the potential financial cost of not making the transition? Yeah. Um, so uh, let me take, there, there's sort of two questions being asked there. So the, the positive question around, um, do we know what the cost for this transition? And I don't think we do know, to be honest. Um, I think the best that we can do is pull parallels to other large IT migrations like this that have happened in the past. Um, even though it is, um, it is filled with hyperbole related to it, but Y2K gives us a bit of a, um, a window into this. You know, you know, if, you're, if we all remember back, Y2K was about changing a date field. Um, and yes, the world was going to end if we didn't change it, uh, but luckily we did it in time. But um, you know, this was an extremely expensive transition, great time to be in COBOL um, if you were around at that time then. Um, but um, that's probably one of the closest analogs where we actually have some um, figures around it. And this is in the billions and billions of dollars um, for it then. Um, I, I haven't ever seen any actual numbers on other crypto transitions in the past then. Um, I, I think the, the, the things that we have going for us here are one, um, we know this is threat is coming too. We've been doing a lot of work into the standards world and a lot of the large ICT vendors are involved in that. You know, if we look at people that have contributed to the standards process, um, you see a lot of the major ICT vendors um, like Microsoft and Amazon and IBM and others, is Cisco all represented there already then. So that, that speaks well to hopefully the, uh, the roadmap within their product lines um, there. Um, where we haven't seen as much is with Within um, organizations getting ready. And I don't think we have a good way to um, calculate the cost. Um, the negative aspects of it, you're also asking is how do we know how much a, a breach is going to cost? Um, again, that's a very hard one um, to, um, to figure out. Um, maybe the closest types of guesstimates we can use is um, some of the cost numbers related to privacy breaches. So there are there's work that has gone into looking at you know the, the costs of say thousands of dollars for per record for a data breach um, coming from the privacy side of things, and some of that's really driven by lawsuits and things like that. Then um, can't, people have tried to do studies to look at stock price impact. Um, there is generally a, a, a short term impact to the stock price of a company associated with a data breach. Then, but um, I don't know if anyone's done work into looking at the actual cost for this type of breach um, then. Um, 
I think it's a great area of research. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike. We're in time. So we unfortunately cannot answer the remaining questions. Thank you for your generosity and for your support of our special quantum security series. Your information was exceptionally well presented. And thank you to our entire live audience. We appreciate your great support of this special series. And thank you for your great questions. Your participation is always greatly appreciated. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And for those uh, who would like to participate in our quantum working group that puts on these types of events, please send me an email at kpatton at atarc.org. And also thank you to Allison Schwartz for um, connecting us to Mike. So um, like Maeva said, we really appreciate you guys tuning in for this. And we hope to have many more conversations like the one today. So everyone have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. It's my pleasure. Have a wonderful day, everyone.